Okay, maybe I'll get started now. Um, I think um, if the regional coordinators and um, and Greg, if you want to unmute yourself too, um, I think really quickly we'll just do a little round of introductions as we usually do. So I'm Julie Hart. I'm the project coordinator for the state. Um, and I'll probably be doing a lot of the talking tonight, but I do have a number of people on to help me out with answering questions and also uh, managing the chat. Um, so I just really quickly want to put a shout out to Matt Medler. He's a regional coordinator and he's going to help with the, um, the chat. Do you want to say anything, Matt? Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see so many of you, familiar names and faces. I uh, look forward to answering your questions in the chat. Great. Let's see Greg and Molly. Hi, I'm I'm Greg. Hopefully, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, I quite figured this WebEx thing. Um, anyways, I'm the uh, method on the methods committee and the VP of NISOA right now. So, anyways, thanks for coming out and thanks for all your efforts at listing so far this summer. Molly, I don't, I, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Am I unmuted? Yep. Hi, I'm Molly Adams. Um, I am a regional coordinator for New York City and Long Island, um, and I work at New York City Audubon. Ooh. And I'm scrolling through to see um, Kathy Schneider. Do you want to say hello? And Tom Wheeler? Oh. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Tom Wheeler, uh, one of the coordinators for the Northern District. And I'm at dinner, so I'm going to unmute <laughs> for a little while. Uh, Kathy, did you want to say anything? I'm looking to see, are there any other regional coordinators who want to say anything? Um, here, I'm just going to manually unmute you, Kathy. Well, Kathy um, is also, Kathy Schneider is on here and she is the co-chair of the steering committee. She's in the Hudson Valley and has written a book about birding in the Hudson Valley, which is pretty awesome. If you haven't checked it out. Hi, everybody. Uh, hey, Kathy. <laughs> Am I missing any other regional coordinators? No. Okay. I'm going to mute myself. All right, so welcome everyone. This is our third town hall. Um, these are kind of set up, so I'll do a little bit of a spiel in the beginning about a hot topic. And then um, uh, as you have questions, please put them in the chat window. And then I will do my best to answer your questions. Um, and then other people that are on the call might also help me and chime in with um, additional clarifications if needed. Um, and this is being recorded and will be put about made available on our YouTube site um, in a day or two once I've um, edited it, downloaded and edited it. So um, tonight I wanted to focus on um, any lingering uh, data entry issues that people might be having. I'm still getting a lot of questions about things. And then I really wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about about how to view uh, the data that's been coming in, uh, just to make sure that people know really how to use all of the features on the website. So I'm going to switch to showing you a, walking you through some of the, the features on the website. Oops, hang on, wrong browser, Safari. Okay. Um, so I think hopefully by now most people have have the basics down and, and you're pretty familiar with how to enter data either uh, on your phone or on the website. Um, if you don't have that down, then we do have tutorials on the website that will show you how to 
how to do those basic data entry issues. Um, so I wanted to switch and talk a little bit more about some of the more advanced topics. So one of the questions that a lot of people have um, are starting to have more and more is what to do if you're out atlasing and you cross into a, sep um, a second block and you don't realize it until after the fact, how do you go back and edit those data? Um, so I do have on the website, um, there's a, you know, majority of the content for, for the Atlas is on these about pages. Um, and then on the, the column on the right here, the sidebar, um, you can easily click between the different topics. So right now I'm on the block topic. And if you scroll down here, there's a whole, whole page I put together on how to assign species and checklists to the different blocks. I'm gonna click on that real quick. And I use in here an example from Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. This is a pretty popular place for people to go birding. Most people in the state know about it. And um, the area covers at least eight blocks, probably more, uh, depending on where you're going further. And I do have, I have put together a number of um, tips for how to make sure that you stay within a block. So, you know, that's using the smartphone app, the eBird app that does have the block boundaries in it. Um, and then I also put together Google Earth files and also Google map file. And then you can also download the data into any of your other GPS apps that you might have or a GPS device as well. Um, but if all of those fail and you somehow still end up having a a checklist that crosses into another block. There are some things that you can do. So one is if you catch yourself early enough, then you can stop your checklist and um, and then remove anything that you might have added from the second block from your checklist. And then you can you can actually edit your track in the in the eBird app, or you can just edit the distance, and then you finish that the first checklist and then you would start a new checklist and add in those species. Most people don't catch themselves that quickly and they're doing it after the fact um, and they're trying to remember where what they saw in which block. In that case, uh, what I recommend is that you try to restrict the birds that you saw to one checklist and then make sure that the breeding codes that you're submitting are in the correct block. That's really the important thing for the Atlas. So if you were in the Cayuga Center, Center West block here in the, the lower right of this figure, um, then you would um, enter, you know, everything that you observe while you're in that block and all the breeding codes. And then for the, the birds that you saw when you meandered into the Cayuga Northwest block, you would create an incidental checklist um, for that block. And somebody asked, Charlie asked if you can edit the track. You can edit the track and I, I'm working on putting together a tutorial for how to do that. Um, but that is possible to do in the app. Um, if you go on the eBird help pages, then there is a tutorial on there as well that, that explains how to do that. Um, so, yeah, so I think the, the key thing is to make sure that the reading codes are in the correct block. Um, and if you need to just create a separate incidental list for the, the secondary block and put those in there and don't worry about your distance or time, just do it as an incidental and then try to keep the, the blocks correct that way. Um, I also have detailed instructions for, for what to do if you're like standing in one block and you see a bird in a, in a neighboring block um, and how to record that appropriately as well. Um, so that's, again, you're gonna use this incidental checklist for the birds in that neighboring block. You can still record all the species that you see on your current checklist when you're in block A, but for the breeding code, we want those assigned to the correct blocks. So you have to create a separate incidental checklist for block, block B. Hopefully that makes sense, if not, um, you now know where to where to find this information on this block page.
the other thing I wanted to point out is if you, um, it seems like a lot of people still aren't quite sure about how to edit tracks. I'm sorry, how to um, switch the portal for your checklists. Um, so I'm just going to show you really quickly how to how to switch the portal. And it's really simple. Um, so say say you cross into an, a secondary block and you really just have no idea how to split those checklists, and you realize that it's just not you're just you can't make it so that all the birds are from one specific block then you might have to switch it to um, the other portal uh, to the core eBird portal so it's really easy to do that so you go to my checklist you click on any checklist that you went to you go to viewer edit and checklist and then in the top right there's these checklist tools and you'll scroll down and you'll see change portal when you click on that, you'll be able to see the whole list of all of the different portals that eBird has. Um, and then you'll just scroll down to, you're not gonna see New York Breeding Bird Atlas right now because it's already in the Breeding Bird Atlas portal. Um, but what you would do is probably switch it to core eBird, which would be this one here. So it just says eBird. And then you just hit, hit change portal. And then that checklist is, is out of the Atlas. So if you've really screwed up on a checklist, then then that's what I recommend doing. Um, just before I forget, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to switch that back to the, the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. You'll see now that's an option, and I'm going to switch it back into the Atlas. So that's it. That's as, that's how easy it is. Um, so you can go back in time. You know, if you didn't get into the Atlas until, um, or if you didn't realize that you were supposed to be using the portal until like March or April, then you can go back to your earlier checklist and switch them over. Um, yes, we did have the Broadway talk nest. Yes, <laughs> three little baby white buckballs um, and the adult peering at us from behind watching our every move. Um, so that was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about codes. So breeding codes, um, you'll see, you know, um, what do I want to say? Sorry. Um, for some species, there are particular codes that you should be using and other codes that you use very infrequently for particular species. So if you go to the handbook and the materials page on the website, and you scroll down, there's all kinds of these breeding behavior references. And there's one chart on here that's for the acceptable breeding codes. And that chart will show you um, what codes are most often used with a species. There are exceptions. And if you do notice something that's unusual for a particular species, um, and you still are like, no, this is what it was doing. I know that you say it's very unlikely to use that code. Then just enter a comment for that species that explains why you're using that code. Otherwise, you will hear from me this fall. I will follow up with you and ask you, are you sure that's what you really saw or not? Um, and then I also wanted to put in a quick plug. Um, the other thing that you're going to get reminders for from me are for rare species. So on the, the breeding behavior page, Go back here. So, breeding behavior page. There's a whole page here on rare and sensitive species. For those rare species that are breeding, um, we we do ask that you submit um, a rare species reporting form to New York Natural Heritage, and that's really important for us because it really helps us and um, the the DC and the New York Natural Heritage when we're trying to assess uh, wind power projects, for example, um, and where they're located. So if we have those data and we can actually map the exact location where those species are breeding, then, then that's really critical for, for saying, no, this wind farm should not be sited here. There's a bunch of upland sandpipers that nest here. Um, and this is a, there's a list here as well for which species that you should do that for. And I've already started sending out some emails to people if you've already got one. Um, but if you if you haven't, just be aware that that you may get it. Um, I can show you again how to get here if somebody asked. Um, so 
On the about pages, there's the number two breeding behaviors. On the right hand side here, do you see it scrolling down on the top the sidebar breeding behaviors? And then you can scroll down and you can see um, the rare and sensitive species page, and that's where you get it. Um, and we get the rare readers and we get the chart. So, yeah, and then the other thing I wanted to show you on the website, in case you haven't found it, are the frequently asked questions. So if you go to this the last link here, tutorials, facts, links, and go to the frequently asked questions. I just recently went through and I completely updated all of the frequently asked questions based on all the questions that you guys have asked in the previous two town hall meetings. Um, so all the questions that were asked in those town hall meetings are now listed on here in these uh, different categories. Um, there's, you know, like particularly, you know, so I think somebody just asked about um, uh, how to code a sandhill crane. Um, if you hear it singing, then uh, you definitely are, are bugling, whatever, however you want to describe it, then yeah, that would be considered singing for that bird. Um, there are, I don't have sandhill crane in here, but I do have a number of other species that people have asked me about, like chimney swifts and when do you start coating goldfinches and wax wings and what about eggshells and things like that so um so i do have a, a lot of different information on here when you have questions um, about something this is a good place to look first the other thing i'm going to be doing soon i've been getting more and more questions about how to add media to checklists um, and i'll do a post on that really soon about how to add media it's fairly easy um, but there are a lot of guidelines if you want to make sure that it's a higher quality and, and more usable, um, you know, sound file or, or photo for, um, for documentation. Um, so I'll be working on that really soon. Um, there are some people, uh, I know Liza on the call um, just asked me a recent, recently how to extract sound from a video. Um, and I didn't know how to do that, but it's really easy to do, and I know, now know how to do it. And so um, I'm going to put that together into a, a blog post. So when I say a blog post, that's going to be on this news page. You go to the news pages. This is where you'll see this is basically our blog. Um, these are the same articles that show up on the home page, too. When you're on the home page, um, you click on the home page. And you scroll down these recent Atlas News articles. This is our blog. So, um, so I'm going to do a couple blog posts soon. So one on the how to use media, and then I'm going to do another one um, on how to determine if a block is complete. So that switches me over to talking a little bit about how to view results on the website. And I'm trying to skim through this really quickly because I want to get to all of your awesome questions that you're posting. Um, so I really quickly, I wanted to show you, make sure everyone knows how to use this explore tab. So on, whenever you're on the Atlas website, there's the submit, explore, my eBird, etc. On the explore tab, this is where you can get to a lot of the really great data. So um, the first thing I wanted to show you, I think most people are probably, you know, it's self-explanatory how to use the species maps um, and then um, the thing that I think most people don't realize is how, the, um, how powerful this Explore Atlas Regions is. So the first thing, I have all, I'm very frequently checking at the state level. So I'm going to type in New York to get the state level. And then I can quickly see all of the data for the entire state. So we are now up to 202 species confirmed, which is amazing. Um, and over 80,000 checklists submitted. Um, the other really cool thing that you can do is you can click on these column headers on this table, species, and I just clicked on this um, confirmed here. Um, and I can click on that another time. And then it's going to sort, um, sort all the data. So you can see that American Robin um, is the most frequently reported species in the state. Um, and then can goose and starling and grackle. Um, and you can do that with any of these columns here. 
and and like and I like I did here, you can also do it in reverse order, and you can see what has been really infrequently reported. Um, so there's only been one nighthawk and one whippoorwill um, nest found so far, or confirmation found so far. Um, Alcoon sandpipe surprises me. I would think there'd be more of those. Um, but anyways, but that's it's a really useful thing. It's not obvious that you can sort by these columns, but you can. You can click on any of these columns, and it will sort. And and that's a super powerful way to look at look at information. So I'm going to go back to explore now. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enter um, by county. So I'm going to do Albany County. Um, so this is a good way to see what is actually breeding in your area. If you're working on a block and you're not sure, am I really getting all the species that I should be getting in this block? Is there something I'm missing? This is a good place to go to see if um, if you might be missing something. So for Albany County, we've got 102 species. So again, I can click on this confirmed column and I can see that, um, you know, Panda Goose and Robin, again, are, you know, super frequently reported. Um, but I can use this and say, oh, I'm missing, I don't know, um, maybe let's go down a little further. Let's say, yeah, I'm missing brown thrasher or kestrel in my block. Um, this would tell me that those are actually breeding in my area, and I could actually go out and try to target those species. So that's a really useful thing to be able to know that you can do. Um, and then you can also look here, you can also these tabs, you've got overview, you can do blocks. Um, so you can see all the blocks and really quickly the stats for all those blocks. It's a good way to identify blocks that need additional work on them. And then the last thing I wanna make sure that you know how to do is on the effort map, Oh, sorry, I'm skipping over. I want to just show you any any blocks. So I'll just do Albany, Center East. Here. This is a priority block. Um, again, here you can also sort by breeding evidence. This is another thing. You can sort by an, um, breeding evidence species or date. Um, so this is something I do quite a bit, and I'll I'll sort this list and I'll I'll write down. Um, what's already confirmed or sometimes I just take a screenshot or a, a picture with my camera before I go in the field and I say oh these species are confirmed in this block um, and then I know that I can focus on some of the other species. Um, that's a really good good thing to, to check out as well. Um, and then the last thing I want to make sure that you guys are aware of this here. So I'm sure you guys have looked at that with effort map. Um, and you can zoom in a little further. And I just want to make sure that up here where it says Atlas effort, then you know that you can sort this um, or look at the data in different ways. And the thing that I do the most often is I look at confirmed species. So I'll look at confirmed species. Now this map is much different than the number of hours that have been spent. And then what I do is I'll I'll zoom in to, so I live in Albany area, if you couldn't tell. Um, and then I'll I'll identify like, let's see here, like this is a prairie block. This is one that I actually have been trying to survey, um, but it has very poor access. Um, but I'll go through and I'll identify blocks near me that, that have very little data for them, and then I target those blocks. Um, and then there's this thing here that says block status incomplete, um, and that I have not started marking any blocks yet in the state as complete, um, but I will start doing that soon. And I, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, I will put together a blog post um, explaining how you can assess if a block is finished or not. Um, it, it is fairly straightforward, but some of it takes a little bit more effort. So, okay, I think that's like my quick breeze through of all the little uh, data entry and um, viewing data 
viewing the data and viewing results that I want to, to really quickly cover. Um, so I am happy to take questions on anything that I just talked about or also on reading codes or any behavior that you saw, anything like that. Um, so I'll just um, take Alejandro's question here. Is it more valuable to put a block really hard or spread out the effort or a mix of both? Um, I would say that it's kind of a mix of both. <laughs> we want to make sure that we get thorough coverage in every block, um, but we don't want to spend too much time in any one block because we want to make sure that we can cover all of the priority blocks um, to at least some adequate coverage. Um, and those, uh, let me just show you really quickly how to find the, um, how to determine whether a block is done. So if you go to the website, um, you go to number one blocks, and you scroll down here, um, there's a page on block completion. Um, and there's a whole set of guidelines here um, that ideally every single block would meet all of the priority blocks and clarify all the priority blocks should have this minimum amount of coverage um, so once a block hits that then it will be considered complete and it will show up on the map as complete um, and then we would want you to move to another block i do want to emphasize it so one of the reasons that i haven't um, started marking anything as complete is because July is a really busy month for Alicing. It's a great month to get a lot of the fledglings and, and feeding the young. Um, so, so this is like, you know, prime, prime Alicing season. And then, and so I want to make sure that this part of the year is covered before I start saying that a block is totally done. So if you if you've already met the like Alejandro is asking a follow up question rather than putting in tons of time trying to confirm species you already have probable codes for should you try and hit some new areas yeah so once you've hit this benchmark here with fifty percent of species marked as confirmed then yeah definitely um, I wouldn't spend as much time confirming species and I would move on to a new block for sure. Julie, do you have a sense for how many how many blocks actually have fifty percent confirmed? Because I, I might be biased, um, but I, I've felt like that would be the most challenging thing all along for, for completing a block. And I know the blocks where I've spent time atlasing, I'm nowhere's near that, and the blocks I've looked at in northern New York are nowhere's near that. Yeah, I would say that there's very few blocks that are like that. There's one in Ithaca that's really close. There's a couple in the Hudson Valley that are really close. Um, but I think that's that's part of the reason why I haven't marked anything complete is because July is really the time to get those confirmations. I feel like July is the easiest time to get confirmations. So, um, you know, I was in the Adirondacks last weekend and it was like every other bird that I looked at was carrying food. Or, or was a fledgling nearby. Um, so this is like the time. So yeah, I think there's- yeah. my, my thought process has been that, especially now in July, even though it's fun to go to new blocks, I like exploring new places. So I always enjoy doing that, but I've, I've been trying to control myself and be like, no, it makes more sense to go back to a block that I've been to three or four times. I've gotten the lay of the land. I, I kind of know where territories are. I've got a nice species list from my June visits. Now is really the time to focus on that block and confirmations. Yeah, I would, going, I would agree. Going, going to a new block now and doing a, you know, doing a survey where you can rack up 35 species as possibles, it's not going to be very helpful. Maybe you can go back a week later and get them to probable, but you're going to run out of time to, to do confirmations in a brand new block right now. Yep, yep I, I think that's... Um... I, that's what I would recommend as well. Like, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really jealous of, of the people on the leaderboard that have like 130 species that they've confirmed. But um, 
But I think in order to get that, you have to be spreading yourself really thin across many blocks. And I think it's more important for the effort right now to, to really focus on getting a few blocks carried through this season. And then next year, focus on some a new set of blocks. And then the following year, another, another set of blocks. Um, so that's kind of the approach that I'm taking. And I think, I think it's better once you, you know, once you're really familiar with where to access places within a block, you should probably stick to those until that area is done and then, and then move on. Um, somebody asked about um, nocturnal birds and when, or nocturnal surveys, when's the best time to, uh, to, to do those and it varies. I would say April is really good for owls. Um, and then for marsh birds, probably, and also uh, marsh birds and night jars, you want to be going out for the end of May into June. Um, that sound right, you guys? Matt's the night jar person and Greg is the marsh person. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and going out on nights when there's at least a half full moon and it's above the horizon when you're out in the field, uh, that's the best time for whippoorwills. I think that helps for owls as well. Too. They tend to be more when it's brighter. Yeah, I just typed in a couple uh, couple comments there to, to answer that question, highlighting a few things. Um, for, for owls, oftentimes actually I find this time of year could be really good because a lot of species have young and those young are really, really vocal this time of year. And so a lot of people listen for owls, including myself back in April, plus you're excited about the atlas and there's not all the other breeding birds to look at, but this time of year could be really, really good for checking those out too. Yep. Um, somebody's asking about regional coordinators. This is a question I get a lot. So here, I'm just gonna switch back to the website, bear with me. Um, and on the, the website here, there's a page for the Atlas team. When you click on the Atlas team, you can scroll down. First, you can, you can contact me if you like. Um, and then there's a map that shows you what regions or where the regions are delineated, and that is by different counties. Um, and then when you scroll down, each region has its own uh, web, uh, email address. So depending on what region you're in, it'll be nybba3 dot, and then that region name. So you've got capital region, central region, that's Dave Nicosia, um, which was the question that someone asked, and you've got Hudson region, etc. cetera. Um, and then our generic email is nybba3 at gmail.com. That, that reaches me primarily. Uh, I, I don't know how different regional coordinators feel, but for me personally, if you want to email me, um, just email me at my at my normal email address. Um, I have to admit, I kind of forgot about these Gmail addresses until just now. Um, <laughs> di different people might be utilizing them more. Um, so I think most of the people here are, are active on local listservs. Um, I, I'm certainly happy to have people email me directly at my Cornell address. Yeah, I think some some people are okay and, and some are not. So I think the first thing of attack is to, to try this um, these regional addresses. And if you don't hear anything, then um, the follow up would be either to to contact me or to post your question to on the um, the Facebook discussion page discussion group. There's a lot of people that are are there and checking that regularly and able to help answer questions. Okay, what um, questions have I missed? I know there were a few that came through. Uh, there, there was a question touching on the multiple block issue again, uh, asking um, whether uh, checklists that do cover more than one block, um, will those be caught in some way and will, will, will the data be thrown out? Uh, maybe I shouldn't put it that way. Will, will the data not be used? Right, um, so right now, the only data that we have access to, like that I have access to, is the, the point location that you mark for any checklist. 
and then I have the distance, but I don't know exactly where your track goes. So if somebody crossed the block boundary, it's not easy for me to know that at all. Um, so if you know that you have a checklist that cross block boundaries, you should either split that checklist up or switch it to core eBerg. I, I am trying to, to work with the eBerg folks to get those track locations, but it's not a it's not guaranteed at this moment. So it's, it's part of the reason that we're asking people to use the portal know that people are aware of those block boundaries and that we are asking for this. Um, I think a lot of people also ask, oh, if somebody enters something really cool into poor eBird, it's not in the Atlas, are you going to just automatically switch it over to the Atlas portal? And the answer is no, because we don't know that somebody is um, following the block boundaries and we also don't know if they're using the codes correctly. Um, and, and things like that. So, so yeah, make sure that you're putting it in the right portal. Okay, somebody asked. Okay, there's a few questions here that just came in. Uh, nocturnal checklists start correct me if i'm wrong 20 minutes no it's 40 minutes after sunset and 20 minutes before sunrise is that right or is it the reverse i i think it's 20 minutes after sunset 20 minutes after sunset 40 minutes before sunrise it's not the same i don't know why it's not the same but it's not um and i just know it's 20 and 40 and i always get things screwed up <laughs> um, and the thing is, with the, your eBird checklist, um, if you're spanning that period, it's going to go to whatever period it started in. So if you start your checklist at sunset, then it's going to go for the, the as a daytime checklist and not for that nocturnal checklist. So, yeah, and there's no alert or anything that tells you. That you're crossing over into nocturnal time. And you're correct. It's it's uh, forty minutes before sunrise, and twenty minutes after sunset. Great. Um. Uh, somebody, somebody just asked, will we use data from non-party blocks? And, um, and the answer, Alejandra, are you replied, yes, we will use it. Um, we will use data from all blocks. We will use all the types of data, you know, like people will have traveling checklists, stationary counts, and incidental records, and we will be using all of those data. So, yes. Um, Thomas is asking if the eBird checklist has to identify the block name, and it does not. As long as the, the location, the center checklist location is within that block that you want it to be, then it will be assigned to that block. The only thing is if you, if you, for your purposes, for going back to a site, if you want to know, like, what the block name is or that you're in a particular block for you for you that would be helpful then then by all means add that to your to the your personal location names um okay yeah so common night hawks painting yes i I would consider that song. Greg, Matt. Painting Woodcock, I think would be song. And then if you hear the booming, that would be courtship. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that, definitely. I think that's that's what it said on the Birds of North America site. 
Yeah, they're, they're pretty similar in terms of what the paint call actually functions as and then what the, the booms or the uh, the whole, <laughs> um, whole crazy sound, all the sounds basically that the woodcock makes during their courtship flight. Um, and then again, Greg, somebody is asking about Virginia rail grunting. Um, and I think we discussed that last time that that is courtship. Yep. Yep, absolutely. And then the um, the Kiki Kerr and the uh, um, the Kiddick calls are, are would be an S or S7 call. And you can actually look at the last, uh, in Julie's last newsletter article, um, I basically actually wrote an article here and went over some of those as well. I can throw a link up to that too. It's a good time, by the way, to go out and and get out in your kayak or something to look for rail babies and veteran babies too, by the way, to try and confirm them. Yeah. I want to answer this crow question because I think somebody's asked it twice now <laughs> and, and we didn't get to it the first time. Um, so Catherine says she has a family of crows coming to her feeder and there are juveniles among them. Oops. Um, can I count them on my checklist, despite the fact that they are now good flyers? Um, so you can add them on your checklist, like count them as individuals, but I would not code them. I would not add a breeding code. Um, this time of year, I'd say it's getting too late for most crows, and they're all pretty um, Pretty good at flying at this point, and there's no way to know for sure that they brought in your block. So, whenever you're not sure if they brought in your block, then then don't add that add a breeding code for them. Um. Okay. Uh, uh, following up on the nocturnal, can you change the checklist time? because it was meant to be nocturnal and just move it a few minutes later. I don't see why not. Um, if you, if that was, if you just missed it by a few minutes, then I would just, yeah, I would say that's fine. Okay. I think I missed some um, other questions, species questions, I think. The one, the one thing I'd, I'd say about the changing the time of the checklist is just make sure that if you change the time that you your checklist only represents the birds that you detected during that checklist period during the revised time. True. Yeah. Okay, so we asked about playback. And for now, we're asking people not to use playback. Um, I think there's just so many people birding and we just want to really minimize disturbance on these species. You know, if it turns out later in the project that we're just not getting the marsh birds or the owls or something, we may have a select few people that are trained um, in how to use playback correctly to try to go out and target those species. But, but we do ask that people refrain from, from that as much as possible for now. And, and fishing, um, I do fish personally, I do fish. Um, I try not to overdo it. And if something is agitated or, um, yeah, clearly upset, then I don't, I don't do it. But I might, if I'm like hearing like a bunch of chip notes in the bushes and it's really dense, um, then I might fish a little bit just to see, to confirm that it is a white throated sparrow, for example. Do males sing while they have food in their mouth? They can. <laughs> I don't know if if I don't I don't think all species do, but I've definitely seen some species for sure do that. Did you get, did you get to the Did you get to the S seven question? I'm trying to get there. Oh, where is that? Uh, it's basically whether S7 is for a specific individual and territory or if it's the species somewhere in that block. 
Um, it should be for the individual on territory. So it doesn't need to be like from the same exact bush, but you should be fairly confident that it's, you know, that same warbling vario from this group of trees. Um, and it should be your, based on your own observations, not based on, you know, oh, somebody else had warbling vario in this block, um, and now I have warbling vario, so it's an S7. Don't do that. It's based on your own observations. Um, Greg says you can attract marsh birds with clapping. Yeah, that's another way. Yeah, I can elaborate on that really, really quickly. Yeah, it sounds super weird, but it's actually really effective. Um, I've had like Sora, I've had uh, Gallinules, Virginia rails. Um, usually it's worked more for rails. I haven't really, bitterns are often not the most responsive. Um, but yeah, basically I clap like really forcefully um, a couple times like like that. Um, obviously louder, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, it works pretty well. Um, I usually try that maybe once once or twice or something. Um, usually if, if something responds, it it does immediately. Is it? I, I feel like I've also heard of, of hitting rocks together. I've, I've heard, heard that more for you, like yellow rails, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know about a lot of other species necessarily, but yeah. Okay. Um, I think there were some good questions back there, Matt. Do you have a Heck, there were some other ones. Yeah, the one question, by the way, I think uh, Steve Walter just reposted talking about. Um, Someone he knows who used to work at a site who's seen nests and how to count and deal with that situation. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> we um, generally encourage you. To so for, in terms of your own um, eBird account, only enter observations that you personally see. If there's a species such as this where you have a barn swallow, you don't know anywhere else in the block that it is, um, then you can submit that information to your regional coordinator. And then we have a separate spread, spreadsheet that we're maintaining with those odd um, observations like that that um that might be missed so that's it that's a good question yeah you can either email your regional coordinator or email me about that oh see someone says clicking rocks works for virginia clapper and king rails too i think it's because it's very close to the the clicking sound that they make I see a question uh, from Michael Greenwald. I might need some clarification. Um, he is the lucky winner of a block boundary that goes right through his yard. Uh, huh. So he says, I have a number of checklists that I have to modify. Uh, they are all in the Atlas portal. Uh, then it says, but eBird located all of the nests in my kitchen. Should I modify all of the checklists? I'm <laughs> not 100% sure what that means about the nests in the kitchen. I think. My guess is that, Michael, you have one personal location for your yard, and that happens to be plotted to your kitchen. That's uh, right. If that's the case, um, you should, unfortunately, you should create, um, you should have two personal locations. So it sounds like you should have one in whatever block that your kitchen is in, and then you should create another personal location uh, in a different part of your yard that is in the other block. And if you walk out your front door and you take a right, you would use one personal location. And if you go out and take a left, you would use the other one. And then just don't walk completely around your house. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody else email me and say that they have the block boundary. Is that you, Anne? Yeah, it goes like right through your kitchen. <laughs> so it's like within your house. It's the block goes right through your house. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's really unfortunate and I'm so sorry. But yeah, it, having those two personal hotspots and then putting them into the correct block. And of course, if one of the two blocks is a priority block, uh, just stay on that half of the yard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, so Mike asks, you're making a new you're making a new personal location, but you need to change anything for the kitchen is in the right block. So okay, so there, one thing to clarify here is that when you are making an eBird checklist, eBird asks you to report all the birds you see from your location. So if you want to submit a complete checklist to eBird, then you would report everything you see while you're standing in your kitchen on that checklist. But for the atlas, you would add a second checklist, probably an incidental checklist that has the breeding in the correct block. You might list the robin from your kitchen, but if you know it's breeding in the other block, then you would you would add a robin and the breeding code to the other block as well. And you wouldn't code it on your kitchen list. Hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of confusing. Okay. Um, okay, Mike, email me. And we can we can chat about it, your specific location. <laughs> All right, we have five more minutes. Any other burning questions you guys have? Right, cowbirds. Um, yeah, if you would come with both the host species and the cowbird, um, whatever behavior you're observing, then you would use the same code for both. So if you're seeing feeding young, then you would use feeding young for the, the host and for the cowbird. Um, Okay, yeah, great question. So um, am I still going to be organizing trips to remote blocks once COVID has calmed down? Yes, I'm hoping that next year, you know, maybe we'll have a vaccine next spring and then maybe next summer we can do some more of um, the block clustering events that I had planned to do this year. Um, but I, yeah, I think definitely it's just a matter of when that's going to happen. Um, and then so we have what's the denominator for the 50% confirmed. And I'm just gonna I think you've already got it figured out, but let me just show you really quick. Um if I go to uh, that's not a good place. No. Okay, so go to block data. Um Okay, so you have observed, possible, probable, confirmed, and total. The total is the sum of the possible, probable, and confirmed. So that would be all of the. Um, so you want to divide the confirmed, that 13, divided by 70. And that will give you your 50%. And I'll explain that a bit more to you in this um, post that I'm working on. There's a, a kind of a quick follow up to that, which is um, what do you do with species like flying ducks that were coded? Um, will there be a subtraction process from the total? Yep. 
Yeah, and I have some tips for how to do that, which basically is, you know, look, if you don't know what species are transient career block, then you can look at the, the county list to see what other people have, what's been confirmed in the county. And that should give you a good idea of what is actually breeding in that area. Um, so then you would subtract some of those other transients from that, from the list, and then use that as your total. And Celeste has asked a similar question two different times. Um, if you've already confirmed a bird in a block, do you, do you need to keep coding it at lesser codes? Do you need to? No. Would we like you to? Yes. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is because it really helps us with um, looking at phenology. So, you know, some catbirds might be um, building nests, other ones might have fledglings. Um, and we would want to know, you know, what stages you're seeing in that area, um, what stages of breeding you're seeing in that area and, and track that over time. So yeah, if, if you can do it, it's not too much of a pain, then we do ask you to, to keep entering those. Um, Great idea on um, doing the tutorials for using the sound apps with phone. I'll put in a plug. So Macaulay Library um, has a number of resources uh, related to sound recording, uh, including recording with smartphones. Um, we don't get so much into how to use any one app because they change so often, uh, but we have uh, sort of general guidelines, things to look for in an app, and we have um, two recommendations for uh, both iOS phones and uh, Android phones. So uh, I'll try to put that in, but if I run out of time, I go to Macaulay Library and Resources and you can see that information. Um, a question about Miyabi about the M code. Um, so the M code is a bit of a troublemaker because it applies to the block level rather than the checklist level. So if you have seen, like you're out one morning and you're visiting three different areas and by the time you're on your third checklist, you've noticed seven different song sparrows in the block, um, then you might only have three on this one checklist, but you've had seven over on the block. So you would enter, um, you could still use the M code in that case. I, I tend to, um, a lot of the blocks I'm doing are fairly remote and have very little access. So the places that I go, um, and I tend to just have like one area that I'm visiting repeatedly. Um, so I will end up with, yeah, 12 birds and then I'll just use the M code like that. Yeah. Um, great. Thanks, Matt, for linking to the DEC maps. Um, the maps are there for each species. And then one of the things I'm working on is trying to um, provide you guys with like a, a map with the old block names and the block boundaries. Um, for some reason, that page stopped working on the DEC site and they decided not to fix it. They just removed it. Um, and I tried to get them to fix it and, and they're just not going to. Um, so I think we're going to have to provide that, but I don't have time right now to do that. So that'll be something I'll do over the winter. Um, and that way you'll be able to look at like the block level data as well as just the, the species level of data. So I'm sorry that that's been a pain this year. Um, but the blocks don't correspond exactly anywhere, though, right? They don't correspond exactly, but it does give you some idea of what would be breeding in that particular area. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so it's already 7.30, and I, I can stay on and ask and answer a couple more questions, but um, feel free to leave if, if you have other things to do. Um, I really appreciate everyone's effort and 
really great to um it's, it's really great to to be able to put faces to names and um and help you guys answer questions answering questions for you guys and, and helping you um in your efforts in the atlasing efforts so have fun out there. I think July is a great month. I know it's really hot, but it's it's a really great month to, to get out and, and observe great birds. <laughs>